Hi, my name is Dennis. My wife and I live in Washington State, and we have lived on Lake Taps for 20 plus years. Here's a sailing scow that I built with two boys in the neighborhood. It's five foot wide, 10 feet long, a lot of fun to sail. You can stand up and sail it. The boom swings well over your head, very safe boat. Over here to the right is a rowboat, a wooden rowboat I built last winter. And below that, this green boat here is a plastic kayak we purchased years ago. Here's a closer view of that sailing scow. Our summer's about to come to a close, so I was putting a tarp over it to keep the rainwater out. Here's a closer view of the rowboat. I use it as an exercise machine each morning to row about five miles. The longest row I've done in one day is 43 miles, and that was on the Puget Sound around Vashon Island. Here's the transom of the rowboat. The rowboat has a lot of rocker in it. So the transom is well above the surface of the water, and the boat comes to a fine point both in the bow and at the transom, really minimizing the drag and making the boat very slippery through the water. As I'm daydreaming about the next boat I want to build, I envision the San Juan Islands as a great place to explore. It would be wonderful to have a simple, reliable skiff. I can get into the shallow waters around these islands and easily beach it to do some beach camping and just all around fun. Here's a close up view of the San Juan Islands, in particular Susha Island, which is considered the number one sailing destination. It is a place, uh, if we were going to pick just one, I would want to visit. The entire island is a state marine park and allows beach camping. I think they have 60 campsites on the island. And there's many coves you can anchor in. I envision driving up I-5 to Bellingham and launching the skiff there. It's a 20 mile run out to the island. And perhaps we might visit Patos Island, which is the most northwest island in the continental US. Just beyond Patos Island, you come across the Canadian border. This is an idea of the skiff I have in mind. It's a simple flat bottom skiff. It was designed by Earl Brockway back in his day. And the plans are now publicly available. If you Google the Sound School of New Haven, Connecticut, you can probably find them if you dig around their site. It's a very simple boat, very quick to build. However, it's really meant for lakes and inshore fishing. So I have modified it a bit to make it a little more seaworthy by putting a splash well in the back. That's this area here. If you were to be hit with a following sea and water comes through your, your motor cutout, this splash well will catch it and it'll drain back overboard. Also at the bow, I've added a fairly lengthy foredeck and a combing to help with any waves coming over the bow and some additional features which I'll mention later. The boat is very simple to build. It's three quarter inch plywood that spans across the bottom of the boat from side to side. There's four panels that go across and three frames, not including the transom frame. The frames are built of 4x4s across the bottom and 2x6s vertically on the sides. The transom of the boat is made out of two layers of 3 quarter inch plywood and I have opted to put 4x4 posts in each corner connecting the side panels to the transom and a 2x4 frame along the bottom between the corner posts. The sides of this boat are half inch plywood spliced together with a butt block. 
and there are longitudinal framing members running below and above each side panel. The lower member is called the chine log and it is made from a 1x4 and the upper member is called the shear clamp and it is made from a 2x6. I also want you to notice that the 2x6 rub rail is extended above the top of the plywood by quite some distance to extend the shear of the boat or the height of the edge of the boat, the top edge of the gunnel from the top surface of the water, giving the boat added freeboard for safety. In this side profile of the boat, I want you to notice the rocker that the boat has. The maximum beam is approximately at this frame location. The boat has rocker coming up to the stern and also has rocker coming up to the stem. Also notice how the transom in this unloaded condition is clear of the water, helping to minimize drag if the boat were being rowed or powered with a very low horsepower motor. Here's the model out of the water showing each of those three frames and where they're located. In building the actual boat, I will put these vertical frames on the forward face of these 4x4s instead of the aft face as shown here. Mainly because this vertical frame interferes with the butt splice for the sides. And by moving it to the forward face of the 4x4s, I will avoid that area completely. Notice again the rocker in this boat. From the bow of the boat to the stern, there is a nice gentle curve. This really is a semi-displacement type of design. The boat will move at higher speeds. It's just designed more for slower speeds. Lower horsepower motors will be efficient with this design, and the boat will be perhaps a little easier to row. There's a view of the splash well. And there's the front of the boat. And here's just a close-up showing the notch in the transom. Uh, there's a drain hole there I've taped over, one on each corner. And then just showing those external chine, log, and shear clamp. This is the bottom of the boat. There's a 2x6 that runs uh, four and a half right down the center of the boat. That's the keel, if you will. Uh, we'll provide a nice uh, skid to uh, bump the boat on the bottom with without uh, damaging the, the actual uh, plywood too bad. So it's, it's a structural member, but also uh, somewhat sacrificial. And there's how it runs to the stem of the boat. There'll be some shaping there with an electric planer and a sanding disc and, and a hand planer, I'm sure, just to kind of get that detail to look right. And there's where the uh, shear clamps or those uh, rub rails along the top of the boat where they meet at the stem. Just put a nice curvature on those, nice shape totally eyeball. There's more detail of that splice plate I was talking about where the two half inch sides of plywood come together and you have this uh, foot wide splice plate over it. If I move this frame to the forward side of the 4x4 then it would not sit on that splice plate and I think it would just make it slightly easier. You wouldn't have to put as much shims in here between the rub rail and the vertical frame member. There's a view underneath that foredeck. It's just uh, the stem, the interior here is, is a beveled 4x4 post. That's basically it. And then there's a false stem on the outside of it after you get the sides on, which is also made from a 4x4 post. Here's a scale I laid across the model at that 
first frame forward of the transom and that's about where the max beam of the boat is and you can see it's a little over 20 inches so in real life uh, on the actual boat you'd multiply that by four so we'd be a little over 80 inches beam at the um, shear of the boat there's one from uh, it's a blurry picture but it's from the uh, transom all the way to the stem there and it's nearly 48 inches which it's a quarter scale model so 48 inches is 4 feet multiply that by 4 actual boat should be pretty close to 16 feet just under now that's me standing on a scale yeah I'm a big big boy uh, so my weight was 255.7 this day I actually have peaked at 265 uh, prior to building the rowboat and rowing so I am losing weight uh, definitely gaining muscle too in the uh, the arms and chest but today I weighed 255.7 and the reason I'm telling you this is this is me holding the model holding that model I weigh 263 so the weight of our model is uh, my weight uh, subtracted from my weight holding the the boat model and I'm coming up with 7.3 pounds that's the weight of this quarter scale boat so let's talk about scale factors for a minute the length one inch of model length uh, is four inches in the actual boat because it's a quarter scale model obviously but area Will not, will, will not be four times the area of the model. The area of the actual boat will be 16 times that of the model because one square inch is one inch by one inch. In the actual boat, that will be four inches by four inches, which equals 16 square inches. Likewise, with volume, one cubic inch in the, in the model would be four inches by four inches by four inches uh, so that's 64 cubic inches is the volume of a cube in the actual boat compared to a one cubic inch volume in the model so when we're thinking about when we measure a length on our model we want to multiply that by four to get the length in the actual boat but when we're looking at area, area in the actual boat will be 16 times more, and the volume in the actual boat will be 64 times more. So if we want to estimate the weight of the full-size boat, we know weight equals volume times density. So if you have 2 cubic feet of volume, and you have a material that weights 32 pounds per cubic foot, you got 64 pounds of weight. So weight is directly dependent upon volume, and we know our volume scale factor from the previous slide is 64 pounds. So if our quarter scale model weighs 7.3 pounds, the estimated weight of the full-size boat would be 64 times that, or about 467 pounds. So we're looking at about a 500-pound a boat. Now the estimated weight of the boat, the real boat, will be 467.2 pounds as calculated on the previous slide. And we know, well I know, the density of Douglas fir is about half that of salt water. So therefore, the, because the boat is made of a material that's buoyant and it's half the weight of the water it'll be in, then we have a positive flotation equal to the weight of all that wood. So roughly, whatever the weight of our boat is, we'll have that same in positive flotation, which is good for safety. So here's a test. I actually took our model, sitting there at the side of the dock, and shoved it in completely underneath the water, about 12 inches underneath the water and then I rocked it from side to side and forward and aft to get any air bubbles out of it and then I just let it naturally come to the surface and 
this is how it floats. Uh, and I'm very pleased. The, the bow is sticking up above the surface of the water the same distance as those stern posts, which is beautiful. Beautiful, just a level flotation, which is something you hear a lot about in amateur boat building because the Coast Guard really prefers your boat to have level flotation, which is looks exactly like this when it's completely swamped with water. That's good for safety. Now, in the real boat, we would have about 400 to 500 pounds of buoyancy with the boat sitting like this. So I could stand in the middle of that and the boat would not go to the bottom. I could stand there, probably myself, my wife, and maybe a little gear. So that's kind of nice. And certainly you can add additional flotation to this boat as needed. There's another view of it, head on, and there's a little higher up view. Now additional flotation, I thought about those uh, ribs that are used as lifeboats. Uh, here's a picture of Richard Woods at sailingcatamarans.com. This is one of his sailing dinghies, obviously not a catamaran, but you can see those uh, his flotation bags or tubes on the side those are called beach rollers they're used primarily well they're used for flotation like this but they're also used for rolling your boat up on uh, a rocky shore so you don't damage the bottom of it and i found some at fishery supply over here on the right these yellow tubes that are about nine inches in diameter and 60 inches in length made from a real tough material. They say the tube can actually support a 2,000 pound uh, boat weight or whatever sitting on top of it. Uh, I calculated the enclosed volume of this tube to be about 2.2 cubic feet and we know salt water weighs about 64 pounds per cubic foot. So that means each tube will displace 2.2 cubic feet times 64 pounds per cubic feet or 140 pounds of water. And that's fantastic. And the tubes are pretty light. <clears throat> Each tube only weighs about 4 pounds. So you end up net 136 pounds of positive flotation per tube. So I could almost envision um, adding two of these to each side of the boat up high near those rub rails on the outside of the boat, which would prevent it from rolling over if you were to move side to side in a swamped boat, or at least help prevent it from uh, turtling. And you would have quite a bit of buoyancy. You could even put one underneath that splash well along the transom to support the weight of the swamped uh, outboard or whatever you have on the back. So the desired safety features of this boat is that I like is uh, the boat can be quickly inspected for damage inside and out. <clears throat> There's no hidden areas. There's not a deck with uh, you know for self bailing and then uh, underneath that deck filled with flotation foam and you can never really inspect in there or so on and so forth. So it's simple. Uh, the boat has a four deck that deck on the on the bow there to shed oncoming waves obviously not all waves it would encounter it has a splash well in the back to help with following seas that might come through the the transom notch there um, i envision a large gusher pump a whale pump manually uh, that's attached to the side of the boat that you can manually operate to uh, evacuate any green water if uh, it took a, a big wave over the side or front um, the hull is made from a buoyant material and additional flotation can be added as I discussed. I envision a real simple reliable two-stroke outboard. One, they're low cost. Two, I really like them. They're easy to work on. It's as few moving parts as you can imagine and still have an engine that runs. So it makes it very easy to uh, take apart and reassemble even in the field. Uh, 
And then uh, oars, it's a 16 foot boat. It's got that nice curvature on the bottom. It's not gonna be the best rowboat, but it won't be horrible either. So oars could be used as backup propulsion. And if you have short oars, you'll probably have to stand in the boat and row standing up, which is something that's done in Oregon down there in Pacific City with those, uh, you may have seen those dories that beach themselves on the sand. If their motors quit, uh, they have oars uh, that they use and they, they row back into the beach with the bow pointed against the waves and they row the boat backwards, uh, standing up using uh, seven, seven and a half foot oars. Uh, yeah. So that's the project I'm thinking of. Uh, love to hear your comments. And hey, enjoy your day. And, and I hope you uh, uh, check back with this channel and see how I'm progressing. See you later. Until next time.